Um, we're going to start, I think it's always appropriate when we're going to talk about any race season to have a driver lead in with this. Because they're the ones that were behind the wheel, they're the ones that really suffered the pain and the agony. But uh, all in all, I think uh, we had by any measure a great season when you could up against the competition that we faced to bring home our manufacturer's championship, the driver's championship, and the team championship. Um, that, that sets the bar pretty high for the other team. So Tommy, why don't you start us out, maybe give us a little recap of Daytona and Sebring, and then we'll hit the high points for the rest of the year, and we'll get to our autograph session. Yeah, so uh, we touched on it a bit last night, uh, obviously this year, and I've said it again, great year for the team. Um, winning all the championships that there were all for the ones that matter the most, the team, drivers, and manufacturers, of course. Uh, so a great year for the team. Um, most of that was a free card. <laughs> the free card that those guys have done this year a fantastic job. And they were laughing a little bit because it, they, it was basically either they won or, or they finished fourth. Uh, and those races that they won or they finished fourth, um, I don't think we had the fastest car in any single race. I think I think we had the fastest car at Lime Rock, but that was only because um, this year uh, the IMSA changed the rules a little bit and that gave the fastest car in the race um, one point for both drivers. Um, so that became, as we were going through the season, you could tell that that was going to matter towards the end of the year, so, so we thought. Um, so they changed strategy at some point, but we knew at that point the three car could couldn't win the race, um, just on pace and, and looking at everything, how it was going, it's looking very unlikely that we would, it's hard to pass a line rock in any case. So three car had passed this race lap for that one, but everywhere else we were, you know, fourth click, fifth click or something like that. And it was just great strategy calls all year long from those guys getting the car in position to either win the race or make the most of those races that we finished fourth were races where we talked about yesterday, we qualified Six and seven, or seven and eight, or eight and nine, whatever, whatever it was, and it was never that far off. But we were always just that little bit away from uh, from the rest of the field over there. So Daytona was um, definitely not a strong race for us. Uh, we did everything right. We just didn't quite have the pace. Um, the Fords were fast. Ferrari was fast. Porsche was fast. Ferrari was fast. We were just that little bit further off. Uh, the three car was there at the end. They made a great pit call. Um, I think Antonio was leading with about two hours to go in the race, which was the first time I think we had led the race all um, all day. And just one by one, each car just sort of just kind of just started to, to pick them off. So I think fourth at, at Daytona there, which was really the best that we could have, could have asked for there based on how, how our pace was with the race. Uh, for us in the four car, I I don't race most of the year. I just totally, as Doug was saying earlier, they give us some sort of shock treatment, and I was getting shocked a lot this year. Uh, so I think Barcel got hit at some point in the night. Um, we had some damage to the car. Uh, Marcel was still super quick, and then come to find out when we came in for a pit stop, when the car went up on the air jacks and dropped back down, when the uh, I think the lower control arm in the right rear. Had, had broke basically, and that shock of bringing the car up and dropping it down broke in the end. Um, so Ali went out and said the car was completely undrivable. And so the first question that the shock car engineer asked was, hey Marcel, was the car okay? So yeah, it was fine. He was still going quick, quick, quick lap times. And he's like, oh, that's funny. Uh, Ali can't drive it right now. He said, no, it's fine. So the wheel was off a little bit and it was a little bit kind of squirrely into the brake zone, it was fine. And Ollie is screaming on the radio, I can't drive it, I can't drive it, this is terrible. And so, again, come to find out, they brought the car in, and so we think that jacked the car up and dropped it down hard, and that caused something else to break, basically. So that put us quite a few laps back. Then we had a, some sort of a ECU fault, and I think in the end what that was, which was um, we don't have, so the three car has has a quick disconnect for their water water system in the car. Uh, I don't drink in the car hardly ever. Um, Ollie drinks quite a bit, but it's so it's not it didn't make sense for us to have the whole system of plugging the helmets and all of everything that goes into that. So we just had our drinks tube just sort of dangling in the car. Well, I think 
what was happening was is that water was dripping out of the drinks tube onto the ECU. It was getting got the ECU wet and burned the, burned the ECU out. So, um, I mean, well, thankfully it didn't happen when we were leading the race with 30 minutes to go and something happened. We were already lapsed down at that point, but that was a good lesson learned there. So we changed changed our procedure that for the rest of the year with, with the drink system to prevent that. Um, so moving on to the Daytona, went to Sebring. Uh, Sebring, again, was not a good race for us. We had um, something with our radiator, I believe, was not working properly. Um, and we we saw hints of it in practice, but nothing that was alarming. Um, and then after, I think it was three hours or so in the race, that hard, hard running, um, the temperatures were going up, pressures were going up, so something was wrong for sure. We tried multiple times to refill it, and nothing nothing kind of worked for us. We were, took the car out of the race, which is something I don't think I've, unless it was a big accident, I don't think I've ever seen this team just retire the car. They always try to make it work and try to fix it. This was a, a case where we couldn't figure out exactly what it was, so we tried lots of different things, um, but nothing seemed to work. And it, it certainly was going to look. It was looking like if we kept running, we were just going to blow the motor up. So it didn't make sense to just keep running. So we uh, we stopped running. But um, I went to my hotel room. I was staying at the chateau there, and I got to watch the last four hours of the race. Um, watch Antonio have <coughs> probably his best race of his career. Um, again, I don't think we had the, car, the fastest car there that weekend, but uh, based on sort of what I felt the year before in, uh, in 16, once the sun went down for, for me in 16, the car just came alive and it seemed like, it seemed like I had twice as much grip as what everybody else had. And I had that feeling in 16, I, I just got the car, it was, it was caution, and so just about to go green. And I don't know what it was, but I was weaving around and I thought, you know, I have all of the grip in the world. I mean, I could pass prototype car with this much grip. It's what it felt like. That's how that's how good the car felt to me. And I just had that I just had this feeling, just looking at Antonio, this hat, just how he had been driving all weekend, I knew he was gonna be fast. And sure enough, once it went green, that guy just threw the race of his life. And I and I, I said on Twitter, I was just watching the race and kind of commentating a little bit, and I said, you're about to watch one of the best rides for Antonio, and sure enough, two hours later, he had passed three or four cars, and cars that he shouldn't have been passing based on the pace of our car all weekend long. There's just something about that racetrack, this car, this car, over the years, whether it's C5, or C6, or C7 now, um, Sebring in the nighttime, at the end of the race, our car comes alive, and it's a, it's a real pleasure at that point to drive the car. It's the fastest the car goes all weekend. Um, I think maybe some of it is we're tired and Sebring's pretty dark and you know, you just sort of, just muscle memory you're driving around and you think, oh, I'll just go a little bit faster here and you can't see as well anymore so all of a sudden you don't get scared of the fact that you can't see where you're going in turn one. And, I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you what, the, the cars now, over the years, as we've added downforce and the grips improve and the cars get better, Turn one at Sebring now is unbelievably fast. It doesn't feel real. For the first time that you drive to that corner there and you get it right, it is the most rewarding thing in the world that, you've, that I've ever felt. And there's been lots of times driving race cars where you're like, wow, man, that was cool. You know, like the King at, at, at Elkhart Lake is one of those places where when you get it right, it feels great. But turn one at Sebring in the nighttime in the race, when the car is that good, it's just out of this world. So. Antonio had a phenomenal race, won the race, um, and that, you know, I think was similar to what I felt at 16. When we had the race that we had at Daytona that year, and then we had at Sebring, it just gives you this confidence in the car and the team, and I think he felt kind of the same thing. This gives him that confidence to just be that much better at the next races um, and just get the most out of the car. So. Um, Daytona wasn't a great start, but Sebring, I think, was in many ways sort of a turning point for their season last year. So the drive that, 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 that he had in that race there at the end was, was something special for sure. Thank you, bud. You know, you kind of touched on this. This was not four-car here by any measure. There wasn't one thing, it was another. 
And I get, obviously, you will a lot of interviews, and you know, it's invariably what the thing leads to. Well, what's wrong with the board? What, 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 what's up with those guys? I mean, what are they doing? I said, nothing. I said, you know, it's the same question you asked me four years ago when you said, what's wrong with the three car? And I think I had the same answer for you. Now, those who remember back, we had a year with the three car, couldn't do anything right. They could not get out of their own way. Nobody was doing anything different. Cars weren't prepared any differently. There was no manpower change, no personnel change, same drivers, same deal. You do this long enough, and you're going to have years that just go that way. That's just how racing works. Uh, take a look. I've done this for a long, long, long time, and I know what that feels like. The team has done it for a long time. There's a value in creating continuity in our program. Because now we have guys that have understood what it's like to be at the top, and we have guys that understand what it feels like to be at the bottom. The key factor is, when you're at that bottom, we now have guys who know how to bring themselves back up. And when you have a new team or a young team, they haven't experienced that yet. And they may never know, they may never learn how to work themselves back to the top. But we've been doing it long enough, and we've been fortunate enough to learn those life's lessons. And I think that's what has really, really accommodated us quite well in the level of success that we've had over the past years. Knowing how to rebound, knowing how to come back from that kind of performance to get you to the top. That's what wins the championships. And this year was just not any great de greater demonstrator of that than what we saw. And by the way, it's not just mechanical performance. It's the attitude and approach of not only the crew guys who are doing the work, busting their ass, and then, you know, their cars crashing. It's how the other drivers react. How did Tommy and how did Oliver support the team when they were having a crummy year or they were having a crummy race? You know, they're down there in the pit lane when that checkered flag drops and the three car comes across and it wins and the four car's been knocked out and wrecked. When you look at the faces on the four car mechanics, the three car mechanics, and the four car drivers, and you would have presented that film to someone and say, look at those faces and tell me who won. You can't tell. You can't tell. Because internally, yes, are they thinking, geez, I wish it would have been me? But they've done this long enough to know at the end of the day, it's a long term that matters. That manufacturer's championship, team championship, driver championship is what brings it home for everybody. Richard Prince designs our Long poster every year. All right? And I think the last year, our last poster, guys are all, have you seen the Long posters? So the one we did where everybody looks, all the personnel are lined up on the Lamar logo at Lamar, and it's lined up in, in it, it was formed as a Jake of all the team members and the drivers. And our last one was one, which I thought was probably one of the most appropriate that we've ever had. He had the big numeral one outlined with people and the word team outlined with people. And the cars were strategically positioned in there. One team, that's what we do. We have one team. We have two cars, two sets of drivers, two sets of crew. But at the end of the day, we operate as one team. And you can go up throughout that pattern. And I can tell you what, there's nobody. They talk it, they want it, they hope to get it, they don't know how to achieve it, and they don't have it. All right? They are divided, and it shows in their performance. When you can establish yourself as one team moving forward, everybody falling on the road in the same directions, great things happen. And uh, I don't think there was any of them more emblematic of that than our past 2017. We operated as one. They did a great job. We've got limited time. I know you guys probably have questions about what went on in 2017. We're here to answer any questions about something that happened in the past, anything that's going on right now, and anything that we might be doing in the future. And as I tell my people at the Corvette Corral, all right, if I don't know an answer, I will make one up so good you won't know the difference. <laughs> so everybody be happy. Who's got questions? It's got to be one. Everybody right now just finish that sandwich, just kind of process and they're in that little insulin overload mode. Yes, sir. So, 2000 to 2008, taking a look at your overall record, there were a lot of firsts, a lot of firsts and seconds. That seemed to be the period of time <clears throat> that you guys were knocking out in one, two finishes. Uh, I think of the 106 wins, you've got 56 or 58 or one, two finishes. But it seems to be concentrated in 2002, uh, 2000, 2008. So has, from 2008 to present, has everybody caught up? Uh, or is it BOP? Uh, just what? What do you think the All dynamic right. is? That's, that's a good question. The question was back in the late 2000s, 
All right? We not only were winning races, but we were finishing one, too. I think we've now collected, you know, people talk about 106 wins as being an accomplishment. Well, like I, tell you, like I can tell you, I'm not, I'm not sure any other team in the history of road racing, same team, same car, same brand, could even remotely approach 106 wins. It just it doesn't exist. It's teams, there's great teams out there like Yost, and, but they've not been same team, same car, same brain. But more astounding to me, and anybody who understands the difficulty and challenges of the sport, is the fact that say we have 62 one, two finishes. Are you kidding me? That's the number. How the hell do you do that? But in full disclosure, there was a period of about a year and a half there when we had run everybody out of the GT1 category, and we were racing ourselves. Good point. Yes, and that attributes for a chunk of those one two finishes. Has the competition gotten stronger? Unquestionably stronger. Has it gotten deeper? Way more brands involved, way more factors. You know, we came close to a one two this year someplace, I mean, we, we, we didn't. Could have been BIR. It was BIR. Could have been a BIR. Would have been BIR. Should have been BIR. <laughs> but then again, we won the manufacturing championship. Thank you, Bert. Um, so that was that was played a, a large role in in uh, in how we accomplished all those one two victories. You know, it, which reminds me of, of an interesting story because as we put everybody essentially out of business in GT1, uh, Gary Claudio, who we arrested, who was our marketing manager, said, "Well, what are we going to do now?" We got nobody to race. I mean, what, how, what about, what about, use all. I said, well, we're going to race ourselves. What do you mean? I said, we're going to go to the racetrack and we're going to race ourselves. We'll put the three car against the four car. We'll let those guys duke it out. Well, that's never going to sell. I said, well, why do you say that? Well, we've got to have a competition. I said, no, you don't. We'll be competition amongst ourselves. So I had to have Doug. You can sell that. He wasn't a part of that train, all right? He got right off the stage and said, I'm not going forward. So, the next logical thing would be, my phone rings and it's our manager. I said, Doug, we need to come and talk to you about the score of the racing team. This can be around in here. Um, who do you plan on racing next year? I said, we're planning on racing each other. That's <laughs> just those words. And they looked at me like I had three eyes. <laughs> what, what, do you, what, what do you mean? I said, well, what did I say? We're going to race each other. We're going to go to a racetrack, the three cars are going to race the four car. Do you know how much that costs? I said, yeah, I know exactly how much it costs. I've done all the numbers. Well, explain to them. I don't, I don't begin to understand what you're thinking. I said, here's the thing. You need to put it in other terms. I want you to look at all the marketing and sales programs you operate. So let's just say that next year we're going to have a new marketing program. Because we don't do TV. You've never seen a Corvette ad on TV. You never see a Corvette ad in print unless it's an auto week thing that we get for the other advertising we run. We never want to buy anything. We don't even win ads. We don't do any of that stuff. We don't do any conventional market. I said, so let's just say, we're not going to race it. We're going to, we're going to build two trailers, and we're going to build some show cars, okay? And we're going to take those trailers around. I'm going to go out to the dealer groups, and they're going to pay us to bring the trailer. And, I, and on weekends or during the week, we're going to set up a display and just show them some show cars. And we're going to travel all over the United States, and we're going to sell Corvettes with our, with our, with our team of show car trailers. They said, that, that's a pretty good idea. I said, well, we're doing the same thing, except we're doing it in a way more exciting environment. And we're doing it in an environment that's going to be broadcast on national TV. It's going to be picked up by media. You're going to get print. You're going to get electronic because we're racing. The dollars are exactly the same, guys. It's just a little different demonstration. It's a little different show. And I said, we're going to do it for a year. And I said, at the end of the year, if we don't see a rise in Corvette sales, if we don't see a rise in all the stuff we sell out of our catalogs, okay, and if, and if we see a significant drop off in Corvette for real attendance, I said, then we can have a conversation about the effectiveness of Corvette racing and how it sells cars. They were kind of taken back by that, but they agreed, reluctantly. At the end of that year, of course, we just introduced Jake, all right, which was another, that's a whole other, that's next year's story. Um, uh, our attendance at Quebec Corrales was up by almost 20%, okay? We're up almost 30%.
Every number associated that was measurable in the things we were doing racing was up, and we only raced against ourselves. As I said to him, our fans want to come out, they want to see those cars, they want to touch them, they want to hear them, and they want to watch them. And if we can put on a good enough show racing each other, they're going to continue to support us and they're going to continue to buy our product. We raced for almost two years like that. You put on some good shows too. Yes, we did. We put on some hell of a good shows. I got called into the principal's office a couple of times. But you loved it, and fans that were never Corvette fans loved it, and became Corvette fans because of it. So it was a very difficult, very challenging time, but I refused to give in because I knew in my heart that what we were going to do would work. I just believed it would, and it did, based on your guys' response to what we were doing. It was an amazing time, an amazing challenge, and I think one of the really uh, watershed moments in Corvette racing history. But that is long-winded Doug Bean and bullshit story on how we got one, two wins and great numbers. Next question. We got to have one more. We got one? Yes, sir. Tommy didn't want to make anything up. <laughs> um, yes, still on the job. Do we see, the question is, do we see any other manufacturers interested in coming to GTLM? The answer to that is, is yes. I don't have anything definitive on it at this point in time. I'm not willing to make an announcement for another manufacturer. But I can tell you it's working as hard as they can to bring a program to North America. It has to be their largest single market. So it only makes sense that they would race here. They want to come here, they want to race, they're desperate to do so. I would, if I was a betting guy and I had to, you know, pick a number, that would be the number I would pay that probably they're coming. Do I think the agents are interested? They are interested. You saw last year Lexus come into GTD. Why they go to GTD? Well, they go to GTD because it's a little bit easier environment than GTLM. As a manufacturer, and I'm going to toot our own horn here, I can tell you this, that in boardrooms, when you make your presentation as another brand, and you're presenting to your board that you want to go racing in the GTLM series, their response is, are you out of your mind? You know who you have to beat? Yes, Corvette, exactly. We are the bar. And they look at what we've done over the past however many years it's been, 17 years, however many we've been doing this. And they know the kind of commitment and continuity that they have to create and they have to sign up for in order to be competitive. They're not going to sign up and spend two or three years and think they're going to dominate. It's not going to happen. You watch what Ford tried to do, right? And you saw how that ended up at least this year. Okay? And it'll probably be similar next year. You have to be here long term to succeed and survive and take down the king. And that's us. And we earned that spot. We work very hard to do that. You ask any team that's out there that races against us, what value is there in a race? When they win a race, it's a value to them. Because not that they just win, they beat Corvette. They're proud of that fact. We put value in that victory. Because it's not just a GTLM victory, we beat Corvette. That's the measure. And they'll be the first to tell you that. Tommy, you know that. He knows the other driver. Because all they want is all anybody wants to do is beat us. Even if they have a bad day and finish third or fourth, they still beat Corvette and they feel pretty good about that. So that's not a bad spot to be in. I would suspect that one or more of the Asian brands will eventually come aboard. It won't be next year. And it's a good So, you know, we're not going to change anything. I, I, I know all the manufacturers very well. I have regular conversations with them. They all know they need to be in our market because it is their number one market for their brands. They have no place to go to get the kind of exposure they're getting here. They model everything they do after what we do, whether it's a Porsche Corral or a Viper Corral or a BMW Corral, whatever corrals they have where they have 26 cars show up. Um, you know, they want to do, they want to be us. And that's a good place to be in. For us, you know, it's a good challenge for them. It keeps them engaged because we've helped draw fans to the racetrack, which they can then sell to their management to help their programs grow. So they all know it, they all want to be there, it's just hard to get the commitment because they know how steep that hill is. And uh, we're going to tend to make it even steeper as we go forward. Uh, I'd like nothing better than to run this up because I'm going to do it for a couple more years. <laughs> Next question. Yes, sir. Okay, so if by chance there might be 
a mid-rear engine Corvette, <laughs> just saying, <laughs> with, balance of performance, <laughs> with balance of performance being what it is, and looking at how the other rear mid-engine cars have come to the front and then fall back with the various changes of VOP. If by chance Corvette were to have a front, uh, a, uh, front uh, mid-engine car, what would be the advantage for us? No, because you're hit right on, and, and that's been the bottom line all along. Now people say, geez, what are you running next year? Well, we're running the same cars this year. Oh, God, not getting a new car? Well, well good. you go out there, you run five seconds a lot faster than you did last year, well, what, guess what's going to happen? That's right, you're going to type over all your ass, and you're going to drag it around all year. <laughs> all right, so there is, no, there, there, is no, there is no advantage to doing it. If, if there is an advantage, you can witness it. It's short term until they get a grip on it, until they balance you, and then they're going to bring you back to be competitive. I mean, that's just, that's just how it works. So are we at a distinct disadvantage with the product that we're currently running? If we have to run it for a few more years? No, not at all. They're going to give us what we need to be competitive. And uh, that's, what, that's what works. But from a driver's standpoint, is, is the, the feel of the car, the, the, the turning capability, from a driver's standpoint, is there anything? It's hard to say. I haven't driven a Vedette car before. So <laughs> I, would, I couldn't give you that direct comparison. Theoretically, it should be better. Uh, theoretically, it should be, you know, sort of over the long, over a stint, should be a little bit better. There should be small advantages to that setup. Um, again, I can't speak from from uh, from experience. But I haven't heard one like that before. Um, but it, but it's one of those things. I mean, in, in every for every car that I've driven in the past, whether it was a Panos or a BMW or a Porsche or whatever it was, those guys. They take whatever car that they're given and whatever whatever situation that they're given and they make the most of it. And so as drivers, we drive the car and we find places that we think the car can improve. And the engineers, they, they go back and they try to improve the car. So with whatever the, that we're racing, whether it's when it, when, when it went from C6 to C7, and as, we change, as the rules change a little bit, things change in the car, and all of a sudden now we're, we're better here, but we're worse there. And so as drivers, we go through the process of figuring out, okay, how do we make this car better? And the engineer's process is how do we accommodate those those concerns of the, of the driver? And those guys, engineers are, are, are finding things that we don't didn't even know that we needed. Basically, they're like, well, we found an extra 2% of down, front down force for free. We're like, yeah, perfect, great. So, as Doug said, I mean, BOB, the way that it is, they try to make all the cars as close as possible, of course. Um, but there are obviously inherent advantages in certain in, in certain areas. So right now we break pretty well compared to the competition. Um, we'll try to obviously keep that advantage however we can. Whether it, so I don't know if that's just because the Corvette is a great braking car. It could be. It could be something that we're ever doing with the setup. It could be something with the brake pads that we use. There's lots of ways that you can, and it, or, or it could just be our engineers have done a great job with maximizing, you know, that part of the car. So. Every car is different, obviously, and that's a challenge of the series because you have, you have, you know, it could be that that a certain team, a different team in our in our class, would say if if all of a sudden the Porsche guys, all those guys started working on the on the BMW, maybe they can make that car go faster, and maybe vice vice versa. So it's team and car and driver combination they have to balance as well. And as we learn and as as they learn, the car's performance changes based on that. Um, there's so many moving parts, it's hard just to say specifically, well, if you have this car, then you will be that much faster. There's obviously a lot more that goes into it. Thank you. Yep. Bottom line is, we race to do one thing, that's sell cars. You guys are the customer. You're the end user. So any decisions that are made on what the car is going to look like, how much horsepower it's going to deliver, blah, 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 they're done not necessarily to think it's going to give us an advantage in racing because it's it, it, at the end of the day it's not but it's going to give you guys something that's more fun to drive and it's going to be race bred and you know you have the confidence in that and that's why it works so well together okay we're not necessarily concerned we're not you know Ford went out and designed a car for the specific goal of winning along we have the only American made car in the series just thought I'd point that out. So, as I'm saying is that was their goal. And they spent, pick a number, one and a half billion dollars, two billion dollars by the time they're done tooling up to do this. And where are they now? 
We're in the business of selling 40,689 cars a year. All right? We're in the business of being the number one per unit profit maker inside the corporation. And then in turn, you still buy the product. So the idea is to continuously upgrade what we're doing to create new and exciting things for you, the customer, and we'll learn to race with it. That's what we're doing. And it's kind of cascade engineered itself up into what you have today. There was another question over here. Yes, sir? It's for Tommy. Uh, watch the, uh, the in-car cameras at nighttime. I just don't understand how you can see out the windshield. What's the, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> is it really that much worse at, at night? Or it looks like? It's pretty dark, and, and we complain a lot about the lights in the car. It's nothing that, that I mean, it, again, the engineers have looked at it multiple times, and with each generation of the car, they try to improve and, and get us more light, basically. One of the problems is, is we have to run yellow film tint on the, on the lights by the rules to, to separate the prototype cars and GT cars. And that film takes like 10 or 15 percent of, of the light output away, gone straight away. Um, so it's a challenge for sure. And as drivers, um, the more that you do this, the more experience you have, the more that you end up using just muscle memory to go where right you need to go, basically. But it seems like the, uh, the prototype is right else right there. Right yeah. <laughs> they do. So when they're coming up behind you, they must be blinded the heck out. It is, it's, it's a challenge. And one of the things that we complain a lot with the series about is those guys love to flash their headlights constantly. And they wait until they're just behind you and it, they flash four or five times and it completely dazzles you and it makes it even worse for them because I can't see now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I don't do that actually, never. Um, no, but it's, so it, 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 it is, it's a big challenge and that, that's what's fun about sports car racing and endurance racing. It's not just a 20 minute race, Whoever has the fastest car wins, it's done and over with. It's a team sport, there's a lot that goes into it. There's you know, there's ways that if you don't have the fastest car that you can be better in traffic, you can be you know, more comfortable in the car with a, with a cooler car inside. There's lots of things that we can do uh, to improve our race base, our race performance. And it's not just about who has the fastest lap over you know, 20 laps, whatever it was. So um, it is, it's, it's a big challenge. Some tracks are easier to see at night than others because there's more light. Um, Seabring is probably one of the toughest. Road Atlanta is one of the toughest as well. It's all the elevation change there. There's just some tracks that are just totally pitch black at night and you can't see anything. And some Daytona obviously is pretty well lit, so it's, it's nighttime, but it's not really, you can see pretty much everything. Um, the only place it's hard to see is that Daytona is just after the king. The king of it. In the infield there, the left-hander, it gets pretty dark for that section. So that your, your, your reference point of break is pretty difficult there, but everywhere else you can see pretty well. Thank you. On a follow up about you, you've got a new camera system that was over the T. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you've got an eagle hands for sure. Um, so in the T, we have a, a, a different radar system on the, on the back of the car. It's just version two of what we've been running, basically. Um, so it just tries to try improve on what we've had in the past. Um, that radar system we started using, I think, 2012, maybe, 12 or 13, I think 13. Um, and it was a project with Pratt Miller and with Bosch. Um, it was basically, I think, started by Pratt Miller and then Bosch came in sort of after the fact. And, um, they're like selling it now, so you see other GTD cars that have it on, the, have it on their cars. I think Ford's have it on their cars as well. You can, you can see the ones that have that sort of radar system sticking up the back of the car. Um, it's helped us immensely over the years with traffic, at nighttime especially. At nighttime, the radar system is invaluable because when you have those guys with the bright lights behind you and you can't, all you see is just this white light. There could be two cars, could be three cars, could be four cars. And the radar system is able to pick out, I think with this new system, it can pick out 20 separate cars. You would never see 20 cars in the mirror, um, but it has the potential for that. So you, so you, so you know with that system that you're never gonna miss a car. Um, and, and again, it, in, the, in the daytime, the, our, our engineers, our, our crew chiefs are spotting for us on TV systems. Um, and they can give us a good idea. You've got two, two person cars coming, three cars coming. Um, but at nighttime, the TV doesn't always follow your car, doesn't always get a good picture of who's behind you. Um, so we have to rely then in that case on, on that radar system. Um, so that's as you saw, it's just version two. It's a little bit faster, it's just a little bit sort of um, more consistent. Still, still some, some work to do, but essentially the function is the same. Nothing, nothing totally different about it, just a little bit 
refreshed. Do, do, do you have the self-dimming side mirrors like you do on the road cars? No. So the, the question was the self-dimming mirrors on, on the road cars. Don't have those. We don't honestly use the side mirrors much, at nighttime especially, because they're such a wide angle lens that it's good for things that, you, that are right up on you. Um, or not, if you're on fire. Or if you're on fire, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we use those just almost as just secondary. The, the camera system, the radar system really is what we rely on most. Any more questions? How did you get started in racing? I got started in go-karts. Um, I started when I was pretty old uh, for most, most kids. Most kids started four, five, six years old in go-karts, and I was uh, 15 the first time I really kind of got in a go-kart. Um, I grew up playing sports, played soccer, and baseball, and basketball, lacrosse in high school. That was sort of my passion. Um, I loved car. I loved my dad on a race team for a long time, so I grew up at the racetrack. I grew up around racing. But I never saw myself as a driver when I was younger um, because my dad never drove a race car in a race in his life. He, his, his story is that he, he drove a race car in practice a couple times and he said he knew he was terrible and he just, just removed himself from that situation completely. So he's, always, he's worked with lots of different different drivers over the years. Bill Scott was one of the guys that sort of kind of brought him along. Um, he was partners with him at a racetrack in West Virginia called Summit Point. That was sort of my home track kind of growing up. That's where I spent a lot of time there, did a lot of testing there with my dad's team. Um, so I started go-karts, did one year of uh, Formula BMW, and then from then on I've been sports cars, did one year with my dad's team, and then was off on my own after that, racing basically in the same class that, that, that we have today, GT2 at that point. Um, Drove the Panos, BMW, uh, Corvette. Now, for seven, this is my seventh year of Corvette, which is crazy. It feels like yesterday I started. Inside of the cockpit of the car looks like something from the space shuttle. <laughs> the buttons and all this kind of How much do you have control over, or do you have to control as compared to what the engineers are saying? Uh, red 10, whatever. <laughs> yeah, so we have lots of buttons in the car. Um, we have buttons and switches and knobs to control windshield wipers, traction control, engine mapping, fuel mapping. Um, it used to be that we could adjust the power steering effort. Um, brake bias is, is a big one, obviously. The radio, we have the drinks button. Um, we'll be here for another hour talking about all the different buttons and things that we have in there. But we'll, what we use the most is brake bias, um, traction we use a lot. Um, the radio button, of course, we use quite a bit. Um, we have a button for the pit speed limiter. We start and stop the car from the steering wheel. Um, so all the things that we use, that we use the most of is on the steering wheel. Um, those are the ones that are most accessible to us, the ones that we use the most often. We have lots of other knobs and buttons to, to use on the, on the center console there, but ones that we don't use as often. So um, <laughs> we don't use, there's definitely because you get so used to using the same buttons, when you have to do something different, the, 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 the engineers have a little cheat sheet on the pit stand there with them that has the whole layout of the, of the steering wheel and the dash. So if they say, we need you to turn the, uh, whatever, goal four, which is another sort of functional switch we have to turn certain systems on and off. I go, goal four. I'm like, look, I'm steering wheel, no, nope, not steering wheel. <laughs> Send the console. Uh, that's kind of gold. So I had to ask, like, is that the second one from the right? Yep. And meanwhile, I'm driving, I'm obviously on the racetrack, and I've got traffic behind me, and I'm trying to make sure I don't crash the car. And so I'm glancing every couple seconds, okay, there's the gold one, and then I make the, the right number of, of turns on there. So it's a challenge for sure. Um, and the more that we drive it, just when you think that you've got it all figured out, they change everything. They change colors, they change the layout, and you have to relearn it again. So. We'll do one more, then we'll go to autograph session. Yes, sir. Doug, uh, speaking of racing yourself, uh, what are the standing team orders when one car is against the, uh, when you got three and four car racing? The standing team orders are issued at the beginning of the race. Don't hit anything, <laughs> don't break anything, and keep it on the racetrack. <laughs> they understand if there's an outcome other than one of those three things, they know what the ramifications are. 
So there really doesn't have to be any outstanding team orders. These guys have been through the drill. They've all had their moments in time where they've had things explained to them, <laughs> both before and after, and they are wonderful students. <laughs> and that's why you see like a 2016 Daytona finish that, that you saw that we were fully trusted uh, what we we're going to present to you, the fan, and to, and to the world. That was there's no greater example of that, I think, than that. I do not. I, 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 I'm sleeping. Yes. Not there. I usually don't come to just before the checkered flag. You know, if I can withdraw myself in case anything bad happens, I can be the first one to the exit sign. I've learned that. I want to thank you guys. You've been a great audience. Thank you. So much to do this for you can say it's fun. We enjoy every minute of what we do. There's it has its challenges in and of every day. But we get opportunities to, to present directly to our customer and engage with you and make you be part of our team. Uh, that's really our, our greatest reward. Trophies are wonderful, but our personal interaction takes it all. You guys are the reason we race. You guys are the reason that it happens. You are paying the bills, and we love it. Thank you all. We'll do our draft now. Upstairs, at, uh, right across from the registration. So these guys are going up. Andy's going to be. Well, Andy was standing right. And there goes Andy. Andy will be joining uh, Tommy and Doug. And I just want to reiterate what Doug just said, and I, and I know we speak for Tommy. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope to see you next year. Oh, one last announcement for the uh, for the bash in April. Doug has graciously agreed, he doesn't know this yet, uh, to do another Corvette racing dinner that Thursday. We don't know who we're going to have yet for our... What's lunch? Well, the dinner, remember we did the dinner and then the lunch and then, yeah. We're going to be doing, for the uh, bash, on Thursday, a Corvette racing dinner. Um, Doug and I will come up with, uh, hopefully, a couple of good featured guests. And then the, the lunch you're talking about, we do at the anniversary. That's keep it. this straight. Keep this straight. That's why I got you. <laughs> so I know Kim makes Karen happy. At the last, uh, our, our first dinner, we got 390 people or something. Great success. So again, uh, autographs upstairs if you want. We got some more, the posters if you didn't get one yesterday. Safe trips home. Who, who came from Texas? Is the Texas people still here? Thank you very much. Let's give them all a hand. Very <laughs> Last thing, if whoever won the oil drop award, if they're still here, the box that it came in, if you want the box to uh, store it, it's up here. And uh, everybody have a safe trip. Go on upstairs. These guys will sign uh, whatever you have. Thank